So, hello everybody. Welcome back to the teacher seminar for the project Education for Technological Literacy and Inclusion. We are really glad to um, welcome you back here. We have the third session today uh, from four all together. So the third session is going to be led by our professor uh, from uh, Estonian Academy of Music and Theatre, Professor Anno Kajurama, whom I will gladly give the floor to. Thank you, Kari, and welcome on my behalf as well. Lovely to see you all here. Today, we're going to have a little bit of different perspective to the topic of streaming. So we will discuss it more from the culture management side, of, from the perspective of cultural manager. And uh, we will concentrate on the performing, performing uh, arts, so performances and events. So rather than looking specifically and to the details of the technology behind, we will look into the, some of the decision making that the art managers need to conduct. And especially thinking about the different kinds of experiences we want to create in the context of streaming within performances and events. My lecture is built on existing material as well as I have interviewed an expert and also conducted uh, one study on, on within the domain of streaming in the events. Uh, we will not go into the details of the technologies, as I mentioned earlier, since we already captured a lot of it through the two first sessions with the excellent lecturers from EMTA. So today, we will have a short introduction to streaming and its history, very tiny one. We will look into streaming on performances to a couple of uh, examples. So a very famous case on Metropolitan Opera, and then two perspectives on within uh, rock music. We will then capture some of the issues from these cases and have a dialogue, hopefully, that what might be the kind of like the solution or answers to the quick questions that we are asking as art managers. Then we will continue in the context of organizing events. And this is more like professional events, such as art fairs, uh, like Music Estonia and so forth, for the professional audiences. We will have an interview from Anne Leino, Unfortunately, she couldn't join us today, so we conducted the interview earlier. And then a case of a specific international event. Unfortunately, I need to keep it um, anonymous, but I think the learners are still there. And then we'll have a short introduction to, to our day four. And please feel free to interrupt me at any time that you have questions or comments, and we can now. Uh, make a pause and discuss the, the things. I will, of course, also kind of like a reserve space for more dialogue. Okay, I will move this. So what is streaming? So in, in this lecture, I look streaming from a very broad definition that it does capture also broadcasting, because live broadcasting, live streaming has existed since the beginning of the television. And this was the definition that I captured from many, many sources. Here I'm building on this uh, uh, what is streaming definition, meaning and explanation on articles, very soon articles. And then also looking at the Wikipedia material from the, from the net. And it is like we see here, the streaming as such is more referring to the method, how we are kind of distributing the content that we have rather than the actual content itself. However, I will kind of go through some of the issues that kind of relate to, to our choices of how we stream and what kind of methods within the streaming we select 
based on the content that we want to share. How do I make this? Maybe I'm okay. Now you'll have to kind of uh, yell because I can't see you at the moment. But some background, like I was earlier saying, streaming or live broadcasting was actually the main format of the television from 1920s to 1950s. And only after 1950s, this kind of more recorded content became the mainstream content within the television. And live streaming, live broadcasting, performing arts has been there from since the 1920s. Yes? And when we look at the, the streaming and the live streaming, there are different versions that we can kind of like think of. I'm trying to kind of get you more visible somehow. Maybe like this. Okay, doesn't work that great. This shows how uh, difficult it sometimes can be just to do everything online. But for example, the Fianna Philharmonic New Year's concert is an ex excellent example of live streaming. Since, year since years and years, we have been able globally to experience the Vienna Philharmonic New Year's concert. It is broadcasted or streamed to an international audience, mainly through television. Nowadays, of course, television is not only looked through the television, but with different devices and different platforms. Sometimes it is suggested that you could maybe not stream directly alive, but make a sp small delay to allow last minute editing. In case something unexpected happens, you can then edit this rather than have it straight live. And for example, the Finnish Radio Symphony Orchestra's Wednesday concerts are always streamed in a way live, but half an hour later. So they are taking the half an hour to allow any editing that might be needed in order to create a good experience for the television. In addition, these uh, concerts are recorded, so they maybe wish to kind of ensure the quality of these uh, concerts also for the future listeners as well. Sometimes we are kind of tricked by assuming that everything that we experience from a live stream is actually live. However, for example, uh, an example from a different field from sports, in cross-country skiing, live streaming, looking at the live competitions is not completely unedited, but actually they add elements, they add the sound of the skis to the, to the stream, to the broadcast, since they cannot have microphones throughout the whole path of the cross-country skiers to make it more uh, realistic, real life way, they add the sound of the skis to the live stream. Of course, there can also be combinations of several content and multi-streaming to streaming directly or at the same time to different platforms. And these have been discussed more with, uh, with the previous lectures, but I have an but nice example from the BBC Proms concerts. They are live streamed, broadcasted globally via television. But at the same time, they are also streamed to multiple uh, picnic areas or parks across the uh, United Kingdom, to Scotland, to Wales, to London, and so forth, to provide the audience is a different type of experience for the pre-PC from concerts. In addition, they are kind of picking up content from these parks where the concert is being experienced and mixing it them sometimes at least to the, to the screens of the park people and sometimes also showcasing it at the stream or the broadcast provided to the global audiences. Have you, I will now pick you back, my 
so I can see you. Have you ever kind of like a, let's go back still. Uh, so how many of you is actually looking or experiencing that? The Vienna Philharmonic News Year concert every year or experience, for example, the BBC proms. Beatrice? Yes, I, I follow the, not every year, but quite frequently, actually, the Vienna Philharmonic uh, concert every, almost every year. Yes. And also the BBC proms from time to time. Anybody else? Marisol, you look like you want to say something. You're muted now. No. Yeah, me also, just like Beatrice. And how do you think that? It, does it make a difference that it is live streamed and broadcasted rather than it would come as a recorded content? Well, you have the yeah, you have the the, the feeling that you are there. It's, it's, yeah. You see yeah. the performers, you see the audience, yeah. Yeah. you see their That's reactions. Right. Yeah, it's true. Of course, they are also very good at kind of like keeping you involved during the intermission, which can be sometimes the time that people disappear. Yeah. When but you they, have they a break for the live audience. And, yeah. and that's when they usually provide uh, recorded content rather than showing people eating cakes. Any other comments or experiences on this? Bari, do you ever watch this? It's not maybe your piece of cake, but no, I'm uh, my uh, my television is occupied by um, Paw Patrol and Peppa the Pig, uh, <laughs> but I've been following live broadcasts uh, uh, from my phone uh, through uh, Instagram, where some experts actually have live um, live uh, seminars where they discuss you know practical topics of uh, of some kind of uh, whatever whatever topic. Um, and it is quite convenient because there's a very lively chat uh, going on on the side of the seminar and you kind of feel still a bit of belonging. So, mm -hmm. yeah, lives are OK. <laughs> <laughs> Good. OK. Uh, Maria, Ines, do you wish to share? Yeah, I, 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 I don't usually use streaming. Uh, I usually watch watch sorry uh, lively the concerts classical musical concerts at least I used to sing for a long time in a choir uh, amateur choir so I was lucky with that <laughs> thank okay. you I actually do do both I kind of also enjoy the the concerts on on stream okay Maybe we'll move along. So what I was saying earlier, that we will concentrate on the experience. Uh, Maria, I think you need to mute yourself. Hi. Sorry. No worry. So the experience starts from the content. Whatever the content is, is kind of guiding how we experience, how we look at the things. And the, some of the elements that we kind of need to look into when looking in the streaming experience is of course the individual, the person, the person's own opinions, experience, uh, preferences. Then, and of course skills as well, how skilled they are in the in technological aspects whenever needed. Of course, the level of skills depends also what kind of tools and technologies are used. So all these elements, the individual context, the technology and engagement are interlinked. Uh, when talking about the context, it's also like how, um, what, what is uh, the surrounding of the content? Is it in a concert hall? Is it somewhere uh, on a home? Is it, uh, are there other people involved, both at the side of where the content is performed, as well as the side of where you are as, as an individual experiencing 
the content. We also have the technological side, and we have elaborated this earlier on Monday and Tuesday and continue tomorrow. So I will not go in, in detail in here. However, I feel that this kind of like engagement, how we kind of are allowed to co-create or participate in the event is actually quite important of, of our way of experiencing. Are we only a listener, an audience, just kind of like a experiencing it? I would not say passively experiencing because of course as individuals, we are processing and participating in a very different way when uh, when we have uh, when we can co-create. Whereas if we are not co-creating but experiencing the ready-made content, yeah. and now I need to take the dog down. So sorry, second. So when we look at these experiences, we have elements that we need to consider. So we have the multiple genres, the contents, what is fitting what, what, what kind of uh, choices we make is dependent on the, on the genre as well. What is fitting as a, as a method for sharing the experience also online to a wider audiences. We have to think about our resources and what we have at hand. Do we have skilled professional studio available? Are we making it ourselves? What kind of technical equipment and capacities we have? And who are we aiming for? And all these can be kind of like shared and experienced in different ways. Is there only online experience? Is it shared experience with something that is happening on site and then streamed to us. These kind of these questions and this kind of guide whatever we need to decide how we want to kind of proceed and work with the, with the streaming and what kind of uh, options we have and what can we actually choose. Would you like to comment on this? Anybody? And I apologize, but I do have my dog here, so can't avoid all disturbances. No questions, comments so far? Okay. Excuse me, excuse me. Yes, Beatrice. Yes, uh, we have the experience in Oviedo, for instance, that they deliver theatre in Oviedo, that they broadcasted the uh, streaming live to Aviles, who is a smaller city in the, and they, they cast him, they cast him. It is a way of increasing the cash flows for the theatre, mm -hmm. because the cost, fixed costs are very high, they need, they need to increase audiences. The way they manage to increase audiences and cash inflows is by this live streaming. Yes. On one hand, you can do this kind of awareness building through the streaming. And of course, sometimes you can also make uh, uh, income from the streaming. Any other comments at this point? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it is ma making also high culture more affordable for for different pockets. Yes, okay? large yes. audiences. La la large audiences. And very often also places where people have hard time to access the key uh, artistic institutions. So it is kind of building this awareness and larger ac access. And of course, sometimes also streams of income through ticket sales for the streaming. And this is exactly the case of the, of the Metropolitan Opera in Cinema case, that on one hand, it is creating access to all people for the, for the opera performances at the Metropolitan, but it is also creating revenues and 
through the cinema tickets and through the kind of like a global uh, global globalization of the opera market for a particular institution. So Metropolitan Opera was one of the first ones to kind of launch this global direct streaming, but they did it in a very particular way when, when thinking about how we maybe main, mainly work in today's world, not through the television, nor through the internet as such, but they made it as a uh, live experience, trying to kind of like a follow the example of going out. So they have live opera streamed globally, presented at the local cinemas. So it is a day out. So it kind of creates this that I'm going somewhere. I'm going to an artistic event, not staying on my sofa, not staying at home. But really, I, I'm going, I'm going to experience the other people. So the context is very specific in this case. It is not the opera, but it is trying to come imitate the feeling of going to an opera. That you actually go out, you are among other people, and you're kind of a feeling not only the performance, but also the other people experiencing the opera with you. So they actually really aim for this kind of true opera experience by having it at the cinemas. Of course, it also helps to have professional broadcasting and it helps to ensure the quality of the, of the experience, of, of the technical quality as such. There are, uh, of course, uh, challenges, for example, the time differences, that when opera performances are live, in New York, it might be not so convenient time in the opposite side of the globe. But at the other hand, it might actually add the attraction that you're going to opera in an unconventional time frame. Uh, they also include moderators. So you are welcomed, you are kind of guided to the experience. You will have some extra than what the, not the normal uh, opera audience will gain by having this kind of insider view backstage interviews, showing a little bit how the stars are entering the scene and so forth with very uh, high quality professional uh, moderators. So all is kind of aiming to maintain the quality that Metropolitan Opera is famous for not to kind of make it everyday experience, but still keeping it something, uh, something extra, something special that we are experiencing. For example, in uh -huh. Finland, I don't know, I have not gone to Metropolitan Opera anywhere else except in Helsinki. There are also sometimes uh, cafes next to the cinema halls, and they are making these specific offerings to the intermissions. So you can go and have even that as an opera experience that you go and have your, your cake and glass of champagne. On the other hand, it might not be the case in all the cinemas. And it of course depends on, on the audience whether they actually engage in taking this. But they keep it so that they don't have intermission uh, content. If we compare it to the Vienna Philharmonica New Year's concert, where they always prepare something and you experience it from your home couch and very familiar places, this is something different that you are really aiming to have this kind of true experience of going out, experiencing opera with, with other opera lovers. And uh, we can say that the target group is opera lovers opera lovers globally, but also these new audiences, gaining these kind of new, new audiences, providing access, providing metropolitan opera with the lower, lower price. I have experienced metropolitan opera evenings uh, in a very different ways. One of the first ones were exactly this kind of, I, I suppose, what they would wish for, having this kind of true opera visit experience, seeing people that I know that are following classical music and opera 
at, at, the, at the cinema, having the coffee and the cakes at the intermission and feeling that I'm doing something special. But I have also gone to the Metropolitan Opera, just to see the opera, have known nothing special at the intermission and just hanged around in the latter rather gloomy cinema theater lobby to the intermission. But yet it, it does kind of create this belonging and the connection to the Metropolitan Opera as such, since you have the other audience there. Maybe I now open once again the discussion of how, how many of you have uh, gone to Metropolitan Opera, they are globally performed, and uh, what kind of experiences you have had. Anybody has been to the opera at the cinema? Maybe we need to make an outing for that. Part of the project we have to go and see, one of the early, early forerunners of broadcasting or streaming live content to large audiences in a, a bit oh, unusual way. Okay. Um, any kind of like a, why I said this kind of like add, adding the question mark to the end is because uh, myself, like I was explaining, have had this kind of very uh, diverse experiences, not actually about the opera itself, but as the, as the experience from the start to the end, that going uh, with a group of music opera lovers, having just like a very excited experience and then more like going to the cine, but it happened to be an opera. So it always depends, like we've had at the beginning, on the individual and on the context, that even though the technology remained the same and, and, and the content in a way remained the same, the experience was completely different because my own expectations, my own attitude towards experiencing the uh, the opera at the, at the cinema was very different. And then the kind of what I did in the, in the mission and how I kind of conducted myself in between was also very different. So it, it depends a lot on the individual and then on the context, because the other one was a, an old movie theater with the cafe and the other one was a new movie theater without any kind of these uh, extra services. So we can see that even if the content is the same and the technology is the same, the experience is changing. Okay. I will then move forward to another other case. So these uh, rock concert cases are based on uh, informal studies with, with people interviewing about how they have experienced streaming at home mainly and what kind of like elements they have been. So my first ex example is, is a global rock concert. So it, it was a globally known rock band that had a streamed concert live. There was no actual on-site performance but they made this performance to global audiences. It happened during the corona times. So it was only streamed and it was streamed uh, to internet. And the aim in this case was not to kind of like a repeat an online concert, but maybe, maybe a little bit different and create this kind of like a more intimate home concert feeling that we are coming to you, we are playing for you but it happened in a global context. There were a limited amount of uh, tickets available to kind of uh, avoid the kind of technological uh, problems of having enough stream and having enough kind of like, a, um, how would I say, enough uh, time to kind of react to the people. So, and the actual performance was done, of course, with the, with the professional studio context. But there was a possibility to chat with the performers. 
So you had kind of like, you had them close by, you had them really at home and you could access it from your sofa. So it was very different type of experience than for example, in the, in the case of the Metropolitan Opera. So you had this kind of intimate feeling that my, my band, my kind of like very distant global band was coming to me, to my sofa. I could ask them questions and they were answering. Of course, none of us know who actually answered the chat, which we can come back later when we talk about the events. But the target post was mainly this kind of loyal fans who really wanted to keep up the connection with they their band being the fans and are they ready to pay for an online concert. Nowadays, I think there is a lower barrier to kind of pay for online concerts as well. And this is, of course, like what Beatrice was saying at the beginning, that some theaters and so forth make the streaming as part of their income stream. But there was this experience of intimacy and having this kind of close relationship with the band and a dialogue. So it kind of created more than the, the people would have experienced if the concert had been on site. It did not even aim to have exactly the same kind of feeling. There was not the other audience. You were not there yelling and uh, shouting together with the other audiences. But you had it. But as a plus side, you have the kind of like a direct connection to the to the band itself, to the players themselves. And this was, of course, something that kind of created different type of experience and different type of value for, for the fans and for the, for the audience than it would have been had it been this kind of like a uh, streamed on-site live concert where you could then see the global audience or the, or the local audience at, at the scene, but there was no audience at the scene as, as such. Then another example is a bit extreme in that, and it would be this kind of like a concert that uh, a local band or my band, whatever, we streamed from home that we, that is done unprofessionally. That is kind of like a hobbyist doing their own concert and streaming it from, from home. Or it could, be, of course, be some other location as well, from a bar or something. But the aim here is really to showcase my band to the friends and maybe reach new audiences, reach uh, attention, hopefully, kind of like opening up the, the doors. Based on... As, as we discussed a lot on, on Monday, these different channels, it could be YouTube, it could be any of the social media channels as platforms. And very often the technical equipment used is not the highest of quality or professional level quality, but it can be just my phone or creating very different type of experience, a very different type of uh, uh, performance in, in a way on, on a streamed context. And very often you try to kind of engage with the audience, provide means for dialogue, either to chat or even with the, with the talking. And here again, it is more like me and my friends, feeling of intimacy, having this kind of relationship with the band and uh, not even aiming for high technical quality. This should be kind of like a rough showing that we are kind of like a, how would I say? This is not too polished like the Metropolitan Opera, but this is something rough and something that we are making for you and showcasing the kind of like a local feeling of how we are here and uh, having this kind of a more, more, I don't know a good word, but more kind of like a not show... Uh, developed feeling but seeing that this is something we do for you from from our love of music and so forth rather than having the whole system back backing it up and making sure that no there are no problems so sometimes even the little mistakes or or showing the camera by to the dog or whatever are kind of part of the 
part of the charm of these kind of events. And they're meant to be like that. that it is kind of like that. The roughness and the non-police quality is part of the part of the part of the fun and part of the experience as such. So do you have any experiences on these? I could maybe stop here that who has been participating in any of that. No. You know, must have participated in a rock concert on online. Yeah, I have. Uh, during uh, COVID-19 time, uh, I um, had this studio experience. Uh, uh, some Estonian bands, um, they arranged a concert from their studio and they sold tickets. So I have, uh, I have been to uh, two concerts like that. And of course, those home concerts, uh, so this slide that we are on at the moment, uh, so those happen uh, every now and then. <laughs> so the good thing about those concerts is that you don't have to buy tickets. Uh. Yes. So people are just showing uh, what they can do uh, and playing uh, the music that you enjoy. So these are very common on, on Twitch and on, on YouTube. But this uh, experience that I had um, uh, from the studio, uh, and watching it from my home. So this was also something that I enjoyed a lot because I liked the idea that uh, I am the one who decides how loud the music is. Uh, and uh, I can have some snacks at the same time. I can go and dance uh, together with my husband. Uh, so so I don't need actually uh, this big crowd around me mm -hmm. because sometimes when I go to a rock concert to a real live rock concert uh, so then uh, I get a bit anxious of the the audience the rest of the mm -hmm. audience because sometimes they might be very aggressive and, and so on so when you are listening to them from home so it feels much safer <laughs> especially because point. Because I, I listen to I listen to rock music and metal music uh, quite a lot, uh, so um, yeah, sometimes it might be uh, a bit uh, a bit uh, no apprehensive or or something something like that. So you never know what these people might do. <laughs> who who are there? And I think that's one of the one of the very key elements also when we have this kind of differences that the role of the other other people in the audience that if it's uh, at home they are still existent in a way if if it's a streamed on-site concert but you are distanced from it and you don't share exactly the same experience it might make you wish to be there or it might make you feel that i'm happy that i'm not there depending on what happens on on when you see the audience behaving and depending of course on the on the context yeah and one one more thing that i enjoyed a lot there was this live chat going on at the same time and this is something that i never get during a real concert so i could see right away whenever there was a song played what other viewers think about this or that so, so you could comment uh, so you could hear what what others are feeling and and uh, you could add your own uh, your, your own uh, comments there so this was a plus uh, a big advantage i think so not only communicating with the band as such, yeah 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 but other, other viewers no? yeah. and maybe even even a bit surprisingly a bit deeper level because you you share more when you're kind of like more deeper things than maybe not emotionally but in a in a more factual intellectual way you share a lot of things about the band and how you experience it or if you experience different songs whereas on site you would more emotionally feel about the, the feelings of, of the crowd and the other audiences any other comments or questions okay but of course these cases just lead us to a couple of more questions and uh, oh well yes I had a third case also maybe we'll go through this one and then we go to the questions so connecting to our previous lectures on the virtual reality I 
picked up one example of a May Day concert during the COVID times, which was a virtual reality concert where we had a live band performing on site in a studio, but where all the participants were joining with their avatars. And I will now share the share the little like a video where they're explaining how they created it, just to kind of have other voices as well than mine to be present. Uh, the numbers went that important. I was more into the idea that we, we can produce a unique gig and have an audience for it. And then when the numbers were that big, I was like, okay, okay, this, this was more than just a gig. Yeah, so sick that we don't even realize it yet. Joani otti meidän yhteyttä ja heillä oli tämmöinen virtuaalinen Helsinki valmiina ja halusi meidän kanssa järjestää keikan. No meille tavallaan keikkan aika niin kuin normiveto biisien suhteen, mutta että totta kai ja yleisö ja näkyy screeniltä avatarit sun muut. Ja, niin se, siihen oli ehkä siihen fiilikseen totuttelu se, että ollaan monta kertaa vedetty se tuossa samassa paikassa ja sitten vielä kun on se niin kuin H-hetki, niin että miten siihen sit niinku asennoituu. Tulee otettu aina keikan aikana bändiin kontaktia tosi paljon ja piti muistaa, että vaikka ne bändiläiset on just siinä vasemmalla, niin et ne on ympäri täällä ja niinku, et sitä oli ehkä eniten harjoiteltavissa. Ja... Ville taisi käydä tuossa niinku sivussa ja sitten tuotantojengisiä ja silleen näytteli peukkua ja niinku tuulettelee, että homma menee maaliin ja paljon katsoja. Et varmaan ne vikat silleen kolme viisi ja silleen. Alko ole vappu fiilis päälle, että tajus, että okei, tämä niin onnistui. Se kun me toi kevään, kevään kiertue peruttiin, mihin olisi varmaan tullut joku maksimissaan 60 000 ihmistä yhteensä, jos hallit olisi ollut täynnä. Sitten VS tämä, että meillä on 1,4 miljoonaa ihmistä nähnyt keikan ja ulkomaiset lehdet kirjoittaa meistä, niin tämä on vähän niin kuin unta. Oli se teki älytön. Ehkä sitä ei vielä silleen myöskään tajuu, että nyt tämä on vasta tehty ja nyt jengi puhuu ja sitten kun jengi alkaa tekemään myös maailmalla, niin sitten voidaan olla silleen niin kuin me tehtiin toi jo silloin vappuna 2020. Full Steam Agency works with leading artists like Ed Sheeran, Rammstein and Justin Bieber. We hadn't done virtual shows before, so it was overall a really great experience. We got to learn a lot about the uh, virtual technology and how that world works. It was really great to be the first one to do something like this in Finland. Alongside live shows, there will definitely be demand for virtual events as well. One of the guiding principles of this concept has been to bring people together, although everyone is at home in the lockdown. Helsinki and, and Zoan, we discussed already in quite early stage that JVG, as Finland's most popular band, is the right band to bring the energy that is needed. It was, it was nice to see that the city of Helsinki, like a really rigid structure of administration, could have enough trust and, and just sleep into the process and, and see what happens. Burst Live is a technology platform that allows a scalable virtual concerts where artists can interact with the audience and at the same time the audience interacting with the artist. And it's something that actually makes you feel that the artist is actually in your living room. So when you're joining the uh, Burst uh, experience, you can create your own avatar. And that avatar is spawned on that venue and the artist can see you there doing all that crazy stuff you're interacting. Practical terms, if you press, for example, dance, 
button, your uh, avatar on the, on the venue will actually dance based on that interaction. So the band saw actually uh, the avatars in front of them throughout the whole gig. We're using Unreal Engine as a technology platform. It's something that we have been already doing for the past five years. And it's so easy because we know that we have a technology which scales really well. And at the same time, we know all the possibilities. So even though we needed to do in this virtual concert something totally new, we knew that actually Unreal Engine is capable for that. Normally our production team works together with the venue and does all the pre-production. Now it was all handled by Zoan. I guess the biggest difference was that there were no live audience. Everyone who attended the show was watching it from their homes. Based on the media reactions that we have got from all around the world, we've had coverage in, in The Guardian, Forbes, Business Insider. This has been described as some sort of like a generation experience. It wasn't the festival, it wasn't the gig, it was an event and it was a damn good event. I believe that Burst Live will be the first virtual space that will entertain one billion people simultaneously around the world. Okay, so that was an. Sorry. hundred songs on piano in an hour. No way. All you need to. Here we go. Okay. So that was an. How would I say a different type of experience on online concert. And uh, I did participate in it. I created my own little avatar just to see what it is like. I'm not the kind of like a technology oriented uh, virtual reality person, but it was, you know, fun. But, but since I'm rather inexperienced, I didn't really get the connection. I should have done. I tried to get my family also to come in, but they refused. So. I was there all by myself, even as an avatar. So I think in that case, it, it it's more fun if you can actually have the, some some people you know joining you. Excuse so me. So has Anuka, anybody Anuka, this? Yeah. Uh, how how did you connect with the venue? You were connected uh, with a screen with your laptop or? Uh, I was connected actually. Yeah, I was actually on the countryside, so I only used my iPad. So okay. very low technology connection for yeah. me. Yeah. And the, the, there was the possibility of connect uh, uh, connecting with VR glasses or not? Uh, just with no, a, no, it was just kind of through that. I think you had the option of the glasses, but I don't have mm -hmm. the glasses, so it was yeah, like okay. double oh, double way in in that yeah. sense. Interesting. So has anybody else had this kind of like a virtual reality concert experience? Mine is very tiny. Yes, please tell us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, through my investigation of the virtual reality uh, glasses, we discovered that there are many, many venues uh, accessible uh, through the meta glasses mm -hmm. and uh, even there are a lot of videos that you uh, that provides you the the platform and you can access uh, whenever you want 
you cannot interact with the artist, but uh, you can feel yourself almost touching the band, touching the artists. Uh, you can repeat uh, the the concert. You can go out or go enter uh, when you want. And uh, was an, an a possibility provided by these platforms. And uh, for us was very interesting because it's, it's like you say, being at the sofa, seated at the sofa, at your home, and then you can choose if you want to 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 listen to a Justin Bieber concert or or Ramstein or that is no or or or, or uh, some group you know of uh, any kind of uh, music even the classical music so was very interesting for us this is experience also okay thank you Vasya anybody else had no okay maybe that's the future for all of us now that we are learning <laughs> okay now i will go to the to the to the questions So when I was uh, thinking of the of the presentation and the lecture, I first thought that I would just list key issues. But then on the other hand, I couldn't like uh, put them into kind of statements because a lot is choices. A lot, there's no one way of doing it correctly. But it is a lot about the, a lot about the choices and a lot about the, how you, how you wish that your audience will experience it, what your audience is like. So what I actually then thought would be a better option rather than kind of making statement that this is how to do it is more like questions to think when you decide that, when you have some kind of content that you want to share through, through online, through streaming, that you kind of start thinking, maybe to, to my advice would be through the audience. So what kind kind of experience they wish to have and what kind of uh, resources and skills and, and technological means I have available and whom do I want it to be accessible? Is it global? Is it local? Is it by invitation? Is it payable? All these kind of choices have to be made. And I think what is leading, leading the decision making is always the content. That, what kind of content I have, and then how how I want my audience, who is my audience, and how I want them to kind of experience it. And we have had a couple of ex examples where we have either this kind of very engaging format that you provide the chat or you provide other means of dialogue or other means of being involved like in the virtual reality case, or we have cases like the Metropolitan Opera where you are a spectator. And I suppose most of the broadcasting of the on television, you are mostly only a spectator. Of course, we nowadays do have also the technological means to, to integrate this kind of chat uh, features for, for, for tele televised uh, streaming as well. And then we have to think about, is this something that I want it to be as close as possible to the like the traditional on-site experience? Once again, back to the metropolitan case, or do I want it to be very different? The extreme might be the virtual reality where you don't even like a, where the audience is there, but in a very different format and different way. Or then in, in between would be this kind of streamed uh, content either from, from on-site in, in this kind of like a hybrid format or then something that is completely created for the online audiences, like we had the examples of the rock concerts. And last but not least is always about these resources. So what kind of resources do you have? Even for this kind of like a home, home concert, you need someone to hold the camera. You need someone to provide a, a, or monitor the 
the chat. And then you need to have some technologies available. You need to have what we discussed earlier a lot yesterday. And then what kind of equipment, what kind of accesses do you have? So all these kind of kind of like the questions that even if you wish to have like high quality experience globally streamed to a very uh, elite audience, if you don't have the resources, it might just become a dream that it just the thinking that online producing online or streaming from online is somehow less expensive is is a bit like a dream because there are always costs in that as well. And the cost might be quite uh, considerable if you aim for a very high quality experience in that sense. Of course, the experience can be very high quality even from the home concept, but a different type. I will now stop sharing and ask your opinions about, do you have some answers or own experiences of making these kind of decisions of creating some kind of content and wanting to share it to the audience. Maybe Pirat, you have, you've been doing a lot of your own streaming. So do you think you can share some experience of making a stream to con like, did you did consider these questions? Oh, maybe not. Okay, maybe it's time for a little pause and we will continue with the more of organizing these kind of professional events in a hybrid or online format. And let's take 15 minutes and then return. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome back. And now we will continue with the other, other bigger theme that we have. Let me see. So we will continue with the with the topic of events. And we will look into events uh, in a more like a professional cases. And the first section is an interview of Annie Leina, one of our alumni from the Estonian Academy of Music and Theatre Culture Management Program, who is currently working at Zodiac as a producer. And she did her master thesis and a study on the on the showcase uh, performing arts promotion, especially focusing on the on the online context. And she also has uh, extensive experience in producing this kind of showcase events, both online and on-site, as well as in hybrid formats. And I will now share the pre-recorded interview with Annie so that you can hear some of the expert understanding uh, and lots of insights, practical insights as well that she has gained through the years of working within the field. Continuing our lecture series on streaming in the context of EU Erasmus project, Education for Technological Literacy and Inclusion. And I have here Anni Leina, one of our graduates from the Estonian Academy of Music and Theatre Culture Management Programme. And Anni, you did your master thesis on streaming. Do you like to present your master thesis and yourself at the beginning? Yeah. So, hi, my name is Anni Leina. Uh, I did my master's degree last, or I graduated last spring from Tallinn, and I did my master's degree on the topic of unveiling motivations and unlocking opportunities, leveraging online showcases for performing arts promotion. So I've been working um, years in performing arts, organizing different kind of showcase events, which could be 
which are so-called B2B events in, in performing arts. So bringing together the festival directors, uh, theatre directors, as well as the artists whose work we are promoting. So during the pandemic, um, I had the uh, honour of, of doing these events as well in Helsinki. And of course, we needed to urgent, we had an urgent need to find new ways to bring these people together in our events. So we did few of the, uh, actually two showcase events uh, as an so-called hybrid events. So combining both online and on-site okay. features. Could you tell us who is we? Ah, yeah. So I'm not anymore if working there, but I used to work in Dancing for Finland uh, still last spring. And we did uh, Ice Hot Nordic Dance Platform, which is uh, presenting Nordic contemporary dance and Performing Hell Showcase, uh, which is uh, promoting the Finnish performing arts for the international audiences. Okay, so where do you work nowadays then? Nowadays I work in Zodiac Center for New Dance, so not so far away, still in, in the field of dance. Okay, maybe we know, now go into a bit of detail about streaming in the context of arts and cultural events. So when when would you recommend that we use streaming? Um, I would say to be first thing is to be a bit critical towards it. Um, I mean, it is good way to broaden your audience. Um, yeah, I would say broaden your audience, but to first start from the content. I mean, it's not for every event. It's not for every purpose. Uh, sometimes it can break also what happens on site. So I would start from the content and ask for myself that is this really needed? Can you give us an example when a mm. streaming is a good choice? Um, for example, for, from my own experience from these uh, uh, showcase events, I think because the scope is international, we are promoting for international audiences. And of course, we had the uh, difficulty to bring those people in Helsinki, which would would have normally do, do, done. Uh, but to make it more flexible for the attendance to pick, uh, I mean, there has <laughs> there doesn't have to be a pandemic mm -hmm. to make it more flexible. It can be a life situation. It can be a matter of resources as well to take part mm -hmm. on site. So yeah, and what would be the kind of content that streaming is disturbing or doesn't kind mm. of fit at all. Um, if there's a, like, if you if you wish that the uh, participants uh, would share something really personal, for example, then I think uh, doing uh, hybrid events, for example, can disturb also the willingness to share mm. on site uh, personal views. But I think people get also more used to that and maybe the key is to be open with the thing that if you're streaming or if you're recording people should know that mm -hmm. yes not have not pleasant surprises yeah, exactly definitely. exactly mm -hmm. how about if if we are now we are kind of recording our discussion mm -hmm. it's not the live stream mm -hmm. when when do you think this kind of content is actually better than the live streaming Actually, that was also one of my kind of uh, results from my thesis was that live streaming it not ne is not necessarily all mm -hmm. like all the time. I mean, um, there are certain if you launch something, if you launch a program, if you launch a product or something that you want to share the information for people at exactly at the same time. Mm -hmm. But but most of the things, for example, performances, uh, the added value on if the person who is taking part in the event remotely does she or he need to have the information at the same time as it's mm -hmm. happening or could it be actually better to just watch it from the recording so i i think it's a matter of how much communication you want to include in this event how much is needed from the for example in this format mm -hmm. i mean I guess we are not expecting anyone to ask from anything from us. Not, not allowed. Wow. Exactly. Yes. But if we would like to have mm -hmm. or have people in, in involved in the conversation, then having this live for the audience would be would be a choice to make. Mm -hmm. You already mentioned this kind of hybrid mm. uh, events. What what would be the kind of like the challenges and on the other hand the benefits on those kind of cases? Quite common, I think, nowadays to have 
it is it is and i i still and i it's also one of the results from from the work that uh i think it's very much going to be the future and present of of uh, for, uh professional events in any sector i would say um but still and this is where we started was kind of the miss understanding of we thought that it would be easier to do online events and mm -hmm. and this is i think it doesn't it's not not at all true i mean it requires resources if not money then human resources um monitoring the live streaming same time when doing the on-site events mm -hmm. there are like the audience multiplies itself also i think what what we're going to see in the future is that uh we are more and more capable of of doing online events so that they are more captivating and more mm, tying people together kind of not just replicating what is happening live but but really kind of tailor-made events for the online environment can you give us an example what would be captivating mm. or what would be something that we can't do live but we can do online um well i think for example education purposes is education is is really a good example on something that content can be shared and easily de delivered and watched in people's own uh, schedule i mean i think there's a lot to learn from mm -hmm. that and is that's probably happening now um mm, yeah but still to be kind of critical when the actual the meeting like face-to-face -face meeting is still important um and i think the combination is really the thing that we are mm -hmm. going to use more and more in the future what was your question <laughs> what would be the kind of like um added element that would yeah, create this captivation mm. in online context i think where we started was to just replicate what is happening on mm -hmm. on site kind of um and it shows from the results of my thesis as well that actually the people taking part remotely are not so interested in what is happening on site if they can't participate themselves mm -hmm. so it's like not if you do a festival music festival uh, on site the experience of taking part is different than if the person takes part on online from their sofa so kind of thinking how the whole structure of the festival could serve the participant better in this mm -hmm. online format so for example time length mm -hmm. is one really practical thing of, of of considering while you do the online event people people won't stay three days mm -hmm. in your festival <laughs> online <laughs> how about then um you you already mentioned this kind of like social connection mm -hmm. how can you do you even try to build it online or how could you build it yeah well let's let's keep like festival event context. Mm, uh, actually the social level is is um element is is the crucial one that that that's what disappears when you go online and that's also a big motivation for many people take part in in any kind of events uh what i found out uh, during my thesis process is that the trust building uh, between people and i think this is a, also how much people are willing to give from themselves while mm -hmm. participating is about trust so kind of and this is from the professional events kind of where you bring people to network or create connections uh, the one of the result was that if people meet at first time online they can form so-called weak connections mm -hmm. which can be beneficial like in a lo long run but still um kind of the trust building it requires face-to-face -face time so in an uh, international i don't know collaboration project that is just about to start i would still meet face-to-face -face, mm -hmm. even though the online meetings would later on be mm -hmm. really just to have that usual connection exactly actually. and yeah. get to know and mm -hmm. so forth also misunderstandings are uh, easily happening online if you haven't if you don't know how to read the person mm -hmm. first how about then for example during the pandemic there were like mm. these um concerts mm. online and then the participants could participate in a very different manner than on site mm. because they could chat with, mm. with the performers or even talk but 
how would you see this? Is this kind of like something that people wish to do or? Mm, I think this is also about how to orchestrate the whole event. Um, I think we all have been in these uh, events that nobody actually takes part, even though they are encouraged to ask mm -hmm. questions or comment, and they are sort of there, but they are not present, and then you're panicking what to do and why they're not saying anything. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, you mean in an artistic kind of context or... Or, or even like a, this panel yeah. discussion that people mm -hmm. are watching you and maybe wanting to ask something or... Well, I have one example, which is really from my own life, from, from the pandemic years, which I think worked really well, was that mm -hmm. one of my favorite artists had like Instagram live mm -hmm. uh, session where, because we didn't have uh, opportunities to go to gigs or concerts, he was in his living room playing the music mm -hmm. and I could like see other people taking part and being present and commenting on that concert. And that was actually something that I think somehow brought the artist closer to me than taking part in a concert in on sites uh, in real life. Uh, but I don't know, there, there's no like one one kind of a way to to build the I would say as bigger the event is, it's probably uh, more unlike that people are willing to, you know, go. Mm -hmm. Also, sometimes it can be a problem that you have a chat and you don't have anyone to monitor that mm -hmm. during the event. That has also happened. That then there's something totally else happening in the chat that should be kind of also. Yeah, it should be connected. Yeah, that this was is a matter one of, of my things. Yeah. Do you need a censorship? That not maybe censorship, but but if you do an event which is hybrid and for example you're in a studio and you're having the you are kind of talking and you're the talking head of the whole event you have to have a, another person taking care of the chat yes. and the, yeah so that means two producers or i don't know three producers even if there's somebody taking care of the like that the broadcasting is working mm -hmm. well and so on so first attempts where really I try to do everything by myself, but mm -hmm. even for a Zoom uh, meeting or Zoom event, I would use nowadays a colleague or a friend or whoever who could help me with the monitoring to chat. Mm -hmm. And do you think that something, uh, something a bit mm -hmm. different, but us as culture manager educators mm -hmm. should start taking into consideration these different roles? In... I think, yeah, yes, but maybe, I think in education quite much can be also recorded and not, mm -hmm. I think it's sometimes it's heavy to watch uh, live stream that is recorded mm -hmm. later rather than a person recording a lecture and then edit that properly and mm -hmm. then somebody like it's really heavy to see these like live streamed recordings yes. or recordings from the live stream. Um, but yeah, I think we need new tools and we need new skills mm -hmm. to build up the online events. I think, and this, yeah, also from my, my thesis uh, research, uh, I I started to think that when I was uh, doing my questionnaire, I, I kind of realized at some point that people have this like awful, kind of awful uh, experience from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So that kind of affects the attitude as well. So they can't really dream of, you know, uh, what what would be their dream online event or dream recording or whatsoever. No, we need to, on yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we as uh, producers, managers, teachers, uh, who else? We need to kind of figure out how to make better content, <laughs> better yeah, and yeah. more adapted yeah. to the online yeah. environment. Maybe yeah. not just strip. Yeah, like you've been saying challenge. that it, mm. it might be like a wrong way of just repeating yeah. whatever is happening exactly here it's or a challenge on site mm. yes what about then you you talked about this three-day event or even a one-day event that it might be hard for people to participate online mm. through streaming how would you then manage the people's time or expectations and mm. and the breaks i mean in in normal event you would go for a coffee but yeah how you then get the people to come back when you're not yelling there that come back yeah um 
I would ask myself first, uh, let's say that I have the on-site event as well going on. Uh, and for us, it was all the time that that was kind of the main thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, parts of it was available online. So I would think you have to kind of construct that for totally, of course, totally different audience. So I would think uh, which parts of the program are suitable online. Uh, where I come from, it's about uh, performances. So, of course, we were really sensitive also that uh, if we didn't put everything online, because not all that happened on stage, we were still selling the stage work. Mm -hmm. So not everything works online. So it's not there's no idea to put a performance in online format if it's not suitable for that, or if okay. it's not transferred. Um, and about, what, what, what about these breaks? I think people make their own decisions anyway. So they can be present, but not really present, or then they can just disappear. <laughs> yes. And what is really common is that they sign up, but they mm -hmm. never show up yeah. in online. So the commitment on these events is it's different. Yeah. Mm. Well, maybe mm. continue a little bit about this, like some performances are not fit for the mm. for online. How how do you know which ones to stream and which ones to skip? Mm. Well, it's about the audience. Who are you going to reach? Like if it's or who do we want to reach and what's the goal of the whole whole thing? And sometimes it can be also useful for yourself to record certain events, even though they wouldn't be like shared or streamed or whatever. Mm. Mm. I don't know. How do you know? It depends really the content. And do you also ask the, the artist? Yeah. Or is it like a producer decision or how does it work in practice? Mm. Well, in the case of showcase events where we had like full length performances in a program and uh, this project pitch uh, mm -hmm. short pitches by the artist and the demo short demo performances. Uh, I think um, we didn't actually uh, we didn't actually live stream any of the performances because like the full performances. yeah mm -hmm. because that's that would require more artistic approach also to how to uh, make maybe more cameras cameras and everything to kind of fit that to the another format. Uh, but then what comes to the short uh, demo performances and and the, I mean pitch program went perfectly online so I think we didn't really need to negotiate during that time with the artist because it's it's for them as well we could uh, we could get more audience and we could also actually use some of the content later on I mean you have presented your work in five minutes so we have a video so you can actually use the video later on in in other contexts just mm -hmm. to share hey yeah, like introductory yeah, yeah exactly mm -hmm. to present yourself somewhere else so yeah so in in fact you would maybe recommend that you not only online streaming mm. but also recording it and then thinking the, yeah. thinking like what to keep and what not to keep also use the professionals i mean um even though we are not the prof uh, professionals in filming or anything, we are actually quite good and people are quite good in reading. We are, mm -hmm. we watch so much videos and we watch so many kind of social media platforms we follow up. So so people know the, what is good quality and the, really the kind of attention span is really short. So it's, it's if it's bad quality, they, uh, yeah, the content is the second thing. To kind of <laughs> yeah. Mm. people get bored or yeah they, yeah they it's so easy it. to skip yeah. yeah but if you can put some resources money people do it great mm -hmm. i mean then that content can serve you yeah. later as well yeah. so maybe rather than doing everything yourself mm. and just having the presence mm. make more selective choices yeah, yeah. and then pick where yeah. you actually put the resources on exactly and that's actually related you can also i mean you get more data out of, 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 for example, using YouTube or Vimeo or whatever platform, mm -hmm. you can actually get data, quite a much free data from the participants and who, who actually watch the video and how long they watch and what mm -hmm. worked and so on. So that's also a tool for developing those. Mm -hmm. Learning, learning yeah, by learning, doing, in a way. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I think we're now coming 
to the sp time span of the listener. Mm -hmm. I think we would talk for, for hours, but yeah. maybe the listeners <laughs> might might not want to hear us for, for yeah. too long a time because what we have learned that this time span yeah. of concentration on online is rather short. But if it's part of your uh, <laughs> studies that you have to do, then I guess it's another thing. Yeah, then you don't have always the choice. Yeah, exactly. But how how would you like to like conclude our discussion? Like what, mm. what would the main core message? Your little pitch. Yeah, and I've been no, I've been talking about being critical, <laughs> yeah. but I would still say also that be kind of sensitive and be be open for kind of give yourself a chance to learn. It's really uh, watching others events taking part in online events that's actually the first step to kind of recognize what works and what doesn't and that's how you start learning and then making notes for yourself and trying not to make the same mistakes as people, other people do <laughs> yeah but learn from those so i would say that really try out and it's not an end of the world if the streaming cuts or if it doesn't work or if the sometimes the technology can be quite intimidating mm -hmm. So just try out. I mean, if it doesn't work, it's not that serious. Usually. Yeah. Then you do something else. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Annie. Thanks. And thank you for the listeners. Okay. Welcome back to our lecture from the interview. Now, even even though I didn't like, uh, we said that there are no questions allowed. If you kind of wish to have any questions concerning the concerning the the interview, please let me know, and I can maybe have some answers. Excuse me, uh, uh, Anuka. Uh, can I ask you about the quality? Recording quality was very high. I don't know whether you employed any exceptional technology to recording or just a normal uh, camera, or if I may. We, we use the studio that is okay. kind of provided for, for teachers. So it okay. was like a better quality cameras and equipment. Yes, because there was no no ground uh, sound no outside sound so it was isolated yeah, it's isolated and it's especially prepared for for online teaching or these kind of small interviews okay thank you any other questions or comments okay then i will continue with the with another example maybe one question one Please. question Anuka. yes yeah and you that have been using this means on teaching for some time do you have some assessment on the uh, let's say the how the learning process works i mean do you have some way of assess what the students get if they get it more online or they get it more through live streaming in education, I mean. Oh, you mean like in, in lecture format? Yeah. Um, I have not done any study, but I think what was lacking, for example, in having this kind of recorded interview is especially the lack of asking questions. And I think in the learning context, having the dialogue and allowing people to, to participate and actually ask questions is very vital. And for example, uh, in, in a different context, let's say with the students and the same lecture, I would divide the students into small groups to discuss the cases before opening up the discussion, just to make sure that, that they think, because it's so easy to kind of, of course, also in the classroom, it's easy to kind of be there and not really listen or reflect the topic. So that would be the something that, and I think that's, easier than when, when you are participating. It can also be a combination that you have certain videos that students need to, to watch, the kind of like the content or the main lecture part, and then allowing them to discuss it 
either on site or in a smaller groups. But I feel that if you only listen, it's really hard to know that if you learn anything, because by processing it in your own brains through through discussion, you kind of learn better. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No. Okay. I will. I have another case once more. I. That's one of the things that I also kind of believe that through these kind of cases where you can see the example of of what what has been done or what has been kind of like worked. You you relate better than just kind of presenting the the topics as such. So this is also like a real life uh, true case that I participated in uh, in in uh, one role for organizing, and it was an online event for rather elite professional audience. Uh, you either are invited or you have to pay quite considerable fee to participate. Uh, usually, this event has been on site, but due to pandemic, it was moved online, and that was quite a learning process for all the, all the organizers, and it, it included several types of organizers. And the event itself had uh, keynote speakers, panels, there were company organizational presentations, there were matchmaking platform. So there were a lot of elements. There were pitches, there were all kinds of elements, and then different uh, streamed content meeting each other and on site it was planned to be on site there was also planned like an exhibition and um, this kind of like one-to-one -one meetings so it was also a choice of what can be taken online and what needs to be left out from the online person and also like adding some features that could not have been done if the event would have been only on site and in this event, there was a platform was, that was tailor-made for especially online events. Oh, some of the challenges that was faced when organizing this event, but of course the first challenge was to kind of selecting what can be brought to the online event and what should be left out. And maybe the only thing that was left out was the exhibition part. So everything else was actually kind of in one way or another added to the to the online event. There was also a challenge that one of the keynote speakers was very high uh, in prestige and in had protocol and security requirements that needed to be first and for, foremost like taken into consideration that how to then integrate this person to the to the event and respect all the requirements that the protocol and the security were kind of a restricting, giving the restrictions. There were quite a bit of concerns for the technology, which technology, how to ensure that technology would work. And then this kind of the transformation, which I already discussed. There was wishes to engage the audience and then also this kind of like uh, adding the collaborators content. There were many partners for the event and each partner had been promised presence on the event. And this needed to be then uh, transferred from uh, having a booth or something at, at the on-site event to, to online format. And I also, in addition to building on my own experience, both as a participating at like rather small role in the in the preparation but also interviewed the main organizers who had main responsibility of of the content and of the event itself and what they felt that was the most difficult thing was to kind of define the different roles and responsibilities between them the content owners they had subcontracted the event organizing company in order to solve the technology challenge, they uh, decided to produce the panels and the keynotes in a studio and how to then uh, satisfy the collaborators that they would have presence as well. 
there was also like pre-organized uh, content that needed to be uh, added, for example, the pictures, pictures format. So how all this could be fitted into one online, one day online event. So there was a huge amount of content. So some of the solutions, so the main content, the keynotes and the panels were put into a studio in order to kind of uh, ensure the quality of the of the streaming and ensure that there were no technical problems. So experience studio was engaged and all the kind of like a keynote people and the panelists were put into the were present at the studio. There was also a moderator, international moderator that has long experience hired to work as a moderator in order to kind of ensure that the discussion would go smooth and there was a chat possibility for the for the con while there were the keynotes and the panels. And in order to include the one keynote with the high protocol and safety requirements and restrictions, that one keynote person was not brought to the studio, but the studio was brought to his, um, let's say, home, his location. So that was actually streamed from another location and then integrated to the one content that was streamed from the studio. So once again, you need this professional quality in, in, in the kind of knowing how to connect these kind of different places and different rooms and different content and make it as a coherent whole. Uh, for the partners, well, maybe a bit more for about the moderator and the, how to kind of ensure that there would be this kind of interaction. It was a quite large event. And as I was said, rather exclusive. So people were not maybe so up to asking questions. And that actually became a problem or a challenge at one point that there were no questions in the chat. But of course, they are the, the, the kind of like experienced moderator. Is, is a kind of like a needed then to kind of ensure that at least the moderator will have questions and will kind of like engage in the dialogue so that it doesn't fall empty. <clears throat> there were a lot of people that had kind of like been asked to ask questions from the panelists and the keynotes, but of course they were also kind of these uh, from mainly from the participating uh, collaborators and with a rather high status in, in their positions. So they did what they wanted and you can't really control this kind of a audience that if you wish that can ensure that there are questions, you would then need to kind of engage people that you actually can kind of like have that kind of relationship that they will do the questions. But luckily in this case, the moderator was quite experienced and could still like, as, as an audience, they wouldn't, or I wouldn't like notice that there were gaps in, in asking questions or that the dialogue would not go smoothly. For the partners, each partner was given their own space on the platform, on the kind of like an overall online platform where you had your own space that included place for videos, place for live streaming through Zoom, and then an, an area for specific chat for this particular partner. Uh, it was kind of like suggested that the partners would make live streaming from their own locations for this own space. During, there were like these sessions that were conducted within Zoom, but many kind of selected because of uh, the uncontrollability of kind of doing this kind of live streaming in a, let's say in a factory or something like that, that they selected to, to provide rather videos and then have a kind of like a key people present at the Zoom and then engage in dialogue with the audience. The chat feature was kind of running in parallel with the whole programs chat. And I think that was kind of like maybe too much that you had too many <laughs> ways to interact and talk that just having one chat, I think would have been enough that there were rather slow, rather little discussion on the, on the 
partner chats, even though the partners have to kind of engage someone like was discussed by, by Anne, that if you have a chat, you need to have someone who is kind of moderating the chat and controlling it and managing it. So each partner still need to have some resource to, to monitor and manage the chats that were really silent ones. And then there were site programs, which were these kind of like pitches mainly, or bringing in uh, other elements to the to the key panel, to the studio. For me, for example, with like a Zoom visits in, in a way that the, the panelists or the keynote speakers could talk with uh, other participants that were of course pre-selected through that the other participant would appear from the Zoom to the studio and there would be a dialogue. And then there was a chance for one-to-one -one meetings. Unfortunately, I don't actually know how much that was used, but to my understanding, it was not hugely used, but it might depend on the that the, the event was not so much about matchmaking, but more about learning and about the specificities of a specific content. So to think about the challenges that were faced, so how to create this kind of move the content of an event to an online event, and even kind of like when you are not like a professional event organizer, uh, but you are kind of the content owner, what they selected was the subcontract event organization that would take care of the actual organization of the online event. But what was kind of faced since they were not so experienced in working with, with an event organization that there were kind of lacks of common in, in communication of who does what and what does it actually mean that we want this kind of content and who takes the responsibility of different things. So this is something that I think we as art managers should kind of take into consideration that we would provide knowledge and understanding to our students in how to work with different subcontracted organizations as well. For example, event organization. But of course, the very big plus from the event organization was the access to this tailor-made platform that facilitated a lot the organization of the online event because it created, it had this kind of like a face, total holistic face for the whole event, and then you could easily access different elements within the event. And then the, the main worry at the beginning was about, about the technical quality, how to maintain a high quality in this kind of context. But this was subcontracted on the studio. And this, of course, you can see from, from, the, from the solutions that it, of course, took quite a lot of resources. So these are not the solutions that for everyone, but you need a lot of resources to kind of take these kind of solutions. And then the partners were given some limits. They were kind of assigned that what they need to have. So everybody needed to have the video presenting themselves. Everybody needed to have some kind of Zoom session, but they had their freedom to think whether the Zoom session contained live streaming from, from the partner or videoed and what kind of dialogue they, they would be inside the inside the Zoom. But they also had to resource these parts themselves. And uh, the use of the professional moderator proved to be very uh, important, for example, in facilitating the dialogues and facilitating that there were no, no gaps as such in the flow of the content. And this was not, uh, even though it was live streamed and kind of like a seemed very uh, on-spot discussion, and had it been on site, there would have been less of this kind of pre-written scripts or practices. But as this was an online event, it was felt that there needed to be some practices of how to work in the studio, where people would be, because the studio was unfamiliar place for all the or the panelists and the keynote speakers. And then there were also some of these pre-written scripts that facilitated the flow of the, of the event. But all in all, it was a 
big learning experience of how to transfer big event to to online context and also this kind of that you do kind of find solutions in in many of the elements and i think uh, nowadays even having the exhibition would be could be a possible in that sense but maybe if you now have any questions or comments of organizing these kind of like a, this was a more or less academic event containing academic uh, research innovation content do you have any experiences of organizing big events uh, with academic content like conferences or or participating in some. I suppose we all have participated in academic conferences during uh, pandemic times. Yeah, I mean, uh, now there are lots of congresses online. So I think it is, I mean, we've, we've got used to to give our, to present our paper there. So, and generally it, it seems pretty easy to do it. You don't get, I mean, the, the, you, you present your paper and you finish there. Well, when you are at the Congress physically, I mean, you present the paper, you see the, the people, and then you go out and talk with the people. That's the difference. But, I mean, at least you can make a presentation, and, and, and that's good as well. So uh, I think all of us have done that. Uh, um, Anuka, I have an experience from the faculty, which is the organization of the graduation ceremony. Uh, of the faculty. I don't know whether this is the, the moment to co to share it with you. Yeah. Okay. So we had at the faculty the, the graduation ceremony. I suppose all faculties to, to do the same. Our faculty is pretty big. We have around 300 students every year. And our main hall is small, just 400 seats. So uh, every year we have to go away from the faculty and away from Bilbao to the main hall of the university, which has around 1,000 seats. So the ceremony with, with some professors, the students, and uh, families were limited to two members of the family for each student. And that, and that went on for years. But last year, uh, the main hall of the university was under renovation works, and we couldn't use it. So the problem was how to do the ceremony. Okay, So we went to hire halls around Bilbao, and that was very expensive. So we, we, we make the uh, answer the question that why not at the faculty? And we did it at the faculty with live streaming the ceremony. So within the hall, we were just the students, the professors, and some special inv invited people. And the families were all around the faculty in the classrooms. And uh, the ceremony was live streamed, so they could see it on the on the within the classes, there were no limitations for number of family members. Uh, the faculty was open, it's always open, but was open for families. So the ceremony was around seven o'clock in the afternoon. Families went there from four o'clock in the afternoon. So they could go around the classes and uh, I mean, the, the students could show their parents, I was here and there, and so this is the cafeteria and so on. So when they, I mean, we had the ceremony, uh, and then we had a little lunch with all the families and so on. And the day after, I mean, the main conclusion was next year, we are going to do it the same way. Because, I mean, everybody found that the ceremony was was carried out in the faculty, the faculty. Uh, the experienced parents had with their son or daughter was, I mean, just almost even better because they, they could see him or her on the screen, big screen there, yes. No, I don't know. Pablo Ortiz, and he's there, and they could see it. They were with parents all around in the classroom, so they had the feeling of, uh, uh, I mean, the, the ceremony, something special. Uh, for us, it's better to organize at the faculty rather than away from the faculty. And also, the live stream uh, signal was uh, directed not only to the faculty, but also, for instance, grandparents from home could see the ceremony as well. So, I mean, a grandparent who couldn't move to the faculty, they could see from home. And so it was really a nice experience for organizing this kind of ceremonies. Because, I mean, when we, I mean, you've been telling us lots of things about live streaming, music, uh, theater, I don't know what, and 
my seven, but in, in economics, this, I mean, this kind of uh, technology is not, uh, but suddenly you find yourself just at the, uh, the I mean, uh, the faculty team, and you have to make decisions, for instance, on this, and these technologies uh, is very useful, for instance, for us, for, for organizing the graduation ceremony at the faculty. That was the experience I wanted to share with you. It was very good, and I think it is very good that you kind of show that it was like three types of experiences, one for the students, but there was also kind of getting to know the place where they're studying yeah. and showing it around. And then yeah. even for the remote ones, there was yeah. the content of the actual ceremony. Yeah. A very yeah. good example. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Marisa. Any other examples or for organizing events or either hybrid format or totally online? Well, I can I can share one uh, that Marisol shared already. That's the conference online. We have this ECTED and ECOS that I mentioned in our meetings before, and you have both um, both uh, opportunities to be on online or to be presentially. And one of the last ECTEDs, it was in I believe in. One Latin country, Argentina, I'm not sure, I don't remember, or, or if it was Brazil. And uh, that weekend that happened, uh, the conference, it was the weekend where we changed the time zone. So people had their timetable to present the papers, and everybody was confused because in that country it doesn't change like we do here in Portugal uh, twice in a year. So every six months we change and it's only once. So we saw the timetable we will be presenting on Friday and on Saturday when we had to present, the hour was totally different. And everybody was late to my, to, my, to my session, let's say, that I was leading. So this can be good, it can, uh, has lots of advantages. And one advantage that Marisol didn't mention is the economical one too. Of course, the advantage is, at least for us Iberian, it's very important to be presentially. <laughs> and, uh, but this was something that happened too and that people could not control. So can be tricky too. That was an experience that I had too, different yes. from this ones. I I also have some experience of this kind of like online or hybrid conferences. I think when it's totally online, it's actually rather easy because you're all in the same 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 room in a way. But if it's hybrid, then some people are in a different room and some people are in an, in another room because the ones online are not actually seeing or hearing what so well. It kind of requires quite a lot. It, if you actually want to integrate the, the people who are on site with the people online. So I have the experience that I just can't hear the questions from, from the audience, from the room. So yeah. that can be it's not possible tricky. to change of room between presentations. If you want to see other presentation in an in an, in, in a distance ways, it's not possible. We have to be in the same room from the beginning of that session till the end. Yeah. Uh, and that's probably another advantage here. Yeah, you can't hop from one one zoom to another. But even I don't want in to that, be positive, huh? <laughs> But even that I just told about, it was kind of allowed <laughs> that people yeah. could hop from one partner to another. I don't know how many then actually did it or how many just went for a coffee because I think one of the lacks in, in that, that people were so eager to maintain everything that it's been too overwhelming, I think, for the audience to think that where to go and where not to go. And and you still need the breaks as well, even online, maybe even more. Now you are muted, Maria. No problem. <laughs> uh, I was talking to another colleague here. Oh. <laughs> sorry okay, for that. Sorry. And I didn't want to disturb your presentation. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so I only now, if anybody, does anybody else want to share or shall I, I have just one tiny ending for the, for the session, so I will continue. No. 
So I have one, uh, once again, and connecting the uh, the streaming to our other other topic that has excellently been presented before is this kind of like a organizing professional event in a virtual environment. And I think this is actually, at least I have not come across in having conferences in virtual environment or this kind of professional events, except I have come across to this in only once, which was in the context of the EU research and innovation exhibition, where we went to do this kind of like a world as avatars. But in addition, and that world presented um, content of uh, research projects as uh, as kind of like a posters or videos. You could also chat with the other avatars. And then you had a Zoom rooms where you could discuss and have presentations on particular topics. But maybe my personal, I can maybe, I don't, I don't have like, I tried to find like material, but they, they have like ceased to share the kind of the actual platform that where we were for the virtual conference. But um, I think many of us that participated in that were kind of like uh, experts in research and innovation and not so familiar with the virtual reality. So there was very little dialogue between the different avatars, even though you could like have this bubble of speech from someone else. And, it, and I was so novice that when someone started to talk to me, I escaped and ran to the other end of the space. So not a very social person. But in a way, it was good good experience. But uh, I don't know if Asia knows that. Has it been like a continued that we would have this kind of like a academic conferences rather than streamed or on-site, but actually in a virtual world that we would be presenting as little avatars or combination of uh, virtual world and these Zoom sessions that were kind of as we have now, but at least I have not come across this kind of like more professional use of uh, virtual worlds, except this I don't, one. I, I don't have any examples, but I'm sure that it is going to come in the, in in a, in a few in the next years. Sure, sure. Yeah, maybe we'll see that oh. if we kind of uh, start increasing the online presence to that that direction as well that's me Anuka. yes please i think i think that this uh, online uh, streaming life is going to mix up in my opinion in my opinion i'm not an expert but i think it's going to mix up with virtual reality because the virtual reality glasses they receive all the content mm -hmm. so and also with the world of augmented reality so I think there will be three three overlapping technologies at once. The streaming life, the virtual reality uh, the headsets that receive this information and the and maybe the augmented reality as well. I think yeah, uh, yeah. there will be a convergence somehow. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Asia? Uh, I suppose you have to be you you have uh, uh watch it though these uh, previous days a lot of videos uh, related to the upper glasses release mm. uh, 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 youtube and uh, there are a lot of uh, ad ad uh, advertisements on this uh, new uh, new uh, device and what i have heard and i think it's true uh, the main challenge is how to spread uh, uh, these technologies uh, in a very easy way i mean the the fact is that the gla the apple glasses cost 3000 euros and nobody can afford this technology uh, rayban also uh, is developing uh, glasses uh, and augmented reality glasses, but they are going to be very expensive. So uh, I I think that these technologies will be mixed with streaming, 
and the, the virtual and the augmented reality once all the devices uh, uh, would be no, no, not not uh, such expensive as they are uh, today, right? If I can afford uh, 50 euros uh, glasses uh, with augmented reality, I suppose I will I will have uh, uh, every people can 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 access to this technology, but I think today is uh, today we do not have uh, enough uh, um, um, expectations expect expectations on uh, on accessibility to this kind of devices because the price. So is 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 uh, I think uh, this is one challenge, and the other challenge is uh, what happens with the cyber security, with the data, with the personal uh, uh, concerns, etc. So there are two main challenges related to these things. Hey, thank you, Asia. And I think these are a lot of the the questions that we are all facing. And uh, I will now share the, the kind of like the summary questions like I had from the other one. They're quite similar that I had earlier, but like the quick questions to reflect when you are kind of presenting or organizing this kind of like event is of course the audience and the presenters. Like we have the example of the of the one of the keynotes that provided specific uh, restrictions. Of course, it might be very different type of accessibility or or concerns that you have to take into consideration between the audience and the presenters, and what kind of experience they they might wish to have, as well as the, of course the means and the skills. Because the example that I presented did have quite a lot of resources and could use professional help, but not always. That is not always the case, and we have to kind of then cope with the with the tools that we have, and of course. What kind of elements you need? Do you need? Do you think that there is a need for this one-to-one -one meetings or need to kind of uh, co-create or organize not in a traditional um, lecture way or keynotes way, but rather have some kind of workshop format? All these can be also done online setting and and with the with the events in uh, streamed out and. Uh, a lot is also to, to, to question about what can I do myself and what should I subcontract and what are the key elements that I would want to kind of subcontract if I have the means to subcontract, which is not, of course, always the case. But once again, I think these are only like the starting questions. And based on what Asir just said, that this accessibility is, of course, really wide. It's not only this kind of like... A, technological accessibility or skills skills that we have to, to use technology, but really like the, uh, do we have the means to participate? Do we have the means to organize? And do we have even uh, connections, like internet connection is, is not self-evident everywhere. And having these kind of capacities to, to participate online is not self-evident for every people. So how to then kind of uh, think of the, equality and equity issues as well. But now I wish to thank you all. And if there are any final questions, I'd be happy. We're going to end a bit early today, but I have enjoyed your examples and I'm really happy to have you all here and looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Now, Piret, would you like to open up a little bit about our program tomorrow? Oh, I don't so tomorrow we will continue with the streaming and uh, having a more hands-on technological perspective and then we will have a summary discussion of of what we learned throughout the, these four days yeah I'm, I, I'm actually here but I couldn't oh, find the, the button to click the the <laughs> the video so the camera wasn't working but uh, as for tomorrow so i'm i have um, 
big plans with you. So I'm, I'm uh, going to introduce different digital tools that can be used to engage your audience. Uh, and uh, I'm not only speaking about these kinds of tools, which uh, you can use uh, during live streaming, uh, but um, it can be just an online event like um, in Google Meet or in Zoom or, or something to do with virtual conferencing as well. But uh, actually the tools uh, that uh, I'm going to show you and try out with you, uh, these can be used in any classroom as well. So during your lectures with students, uh, so some of them might be familiar to you, some will surely be new, but I'll just, uh, I have uh, collected uh, some which serve different purposes so that you can really uh, experiment with them and, and uh, decide whether this tool might be useful for, for your future work. So I won't give you any theory. So just uh, uh, all kinds of um, nice tools and you have a chance to try them all out together with me. Thank you. Yeah. Looking forward for tomorrow. Thank you so Bye. much, Anuka. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Anuka. And thank, thank you. you so much, Spirit, for the guidelines for tomorrow. Thank you so much, Anuka. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all to our attendees. Bye. Bye. Thank you.